Did anyone have an idea that there might be as many stars as the Bible says? No. <laughs> With the naked eye and a really dark sky, you can see a few thousand stars. Of course, Galileo was one of the first people to then realize there are thousands and thousands of more stars than we could ever imagine. So you, you would then say, well, God must know what he's talking about. People that put down the Bible don't know what they're talking about. Yep. Yeah. There are two choices, the so-called Big Bang, or in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Welcome to In Grace's series, our awesome universe, Big Bang or Big God. Have you ever been outside in the country on a cloudless, moonless night and looked up. I remember such a night. I was speechless when I saw the heavens arrayed in glory. I was on a dock over a lake in the Northwoods of Minnesota. The sky sizzled and sparkled and literally glowed God's glory. Does the Big Bang Theory fit the beauty and design that we see in our awesome universe? I wanted to know more, so we scheduled a trip to Washington State to interview Spike Pissaris, a man who made an incredible video series about astronomy. But before we go to Washington, we went to Northern Kentucky and were mesmerized by the Answers in Genesis Planetarium and the resident astronomer there, Dr. Danny Faulkner. Dr. Faulkner invited us to come back at night to look through their telescopes and this is what we saw. I love the setup that we're <laughs> in here. This is like you're a kid again when you're in the midst of all these toys. Oh yeah, oh yeah. That's one of the cool things about being here is we have quite a collection of telescopes here at the Johnston Observatory at the Creation Museum. So when did man start looking further into space? What was the progression of that? Well, the telescope was invented around 1610. Huh. Uh, Galileo did not invent it. Uh, we're not sure exactly who invented it. Huh. The news came, spread across Europe around 1608 or so that this was possible. Galileo heard about it and he figured out how to make one. He gets credit though, we think, for the first person to apply it to looking at things in the sky or huh. the people looking things on the ground. Huh ships and things like this. There's a long story there, but he looked at the moon, he looked at the sun, which is dangerous to do. He uh, looked at star clusters, planets, and he saw some really incredible things. And it's been a steady march of improvement in technology ever since. So was that about when they started to realize the numbers of stars were just incredible? Did, 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 did anyone have an idea that there might be as many stars as the Bible says? No. <laughs> With the naked eye and a really dark sky, you can see a few thousand stars. Uh, there was a fellow, Claudius Ptolemy, who did a star catalog in the second century AD, had I think 1,020 or 22 stars in it. And uh, that was kind of the limit people had until after the telescope was invented. And of course, Galileo was one of the first people to then realize there are thousands and thousands of more stars than we could ever imagine. I like to tell people, if you want an estimate how many stars there are, our own Milky Way galaxy has a few hundred billion, with a B, stars. And we estimate that there are probably at least 100 billion galaxies like our own Milky Way. The Bible says that God has created so many stars that we couldn't count them any more than we could count the grains of sand on the beaches of the world. The prophet Jeremiah wrote that, the host of heaven cannot be numbered, neither the sand of the sea measured. At the time he wrote this though, this would have been considered ridiculous. There are only about 3,000 stars visible to the naked eye. So you can imagine Jeremiah writing this as God inspired him to do so, and then being ridiculed by the best scientists of his day. The best scientists of his day all knew that the stars could be counted because they had done so. But they were wrong, and the Bible is right. Thanks to better technology, we can now see an estimated 100 to 200 billion galaxies. Each galaxy contains about 100 billion stars. That's about 10 to the 22 stars in total. That's a one with 22 zeros after it. That's an incomprehensible number. If you could count one star per second, it would take you over 300 trillion years. This is far beyond human effort, and again we see that the Bible was proven correct, even though for thousands of years, the best available scientific evidence seemed to contradict it. But even though the stars are uncountable, 
there are still a finite number of them. As Psalm 147 says, He telleth the number of the stars, he calleth them all by their names. Again, the Bible correctly refutes incorrect ideas. From the ancient Greeks all the way into modern times, there have been many scientists and philosophers who taught that the universe was eternal and infinite in size. Today we understand that although the universe is vast beyond our understanding, it is still finite in size, and it had a beginning. The Bible correctly describes our universe. One of the thing, cool things about astronomy is you see these neat photos and neat images. You can look through this little scope or just look at photos and see these really nice things. And then the, the astronomers look at it and they, they can see that, but they can also appreciate a lot of the physical processes going on. Mm -hmm. We can use those physical processes to probe what's going on in space, to figure out things like how far away they are, what, what they're made out of, those kind of questions. Huh. As far as it takes you, the pretty pictures of the physics, then you've really missed the whole point. Because, you know, not Psalm 19, one tells us the heavens declare God's glory and the skies proclaim his handiwork. And I think the skies are there as a sign to us saying, yes, there is a creator. You know, Psalm 8 talks about this. Who am I? You know, looking up the sky and surveying your heavens. Who am I? You know, what is my importance in life? And I think that's the most important thing that astronomy can tell us is that we're not an accident. We didn't, we didn't come about through chance processes. And even though we're very tiny in the universe, mm -hmm. We are very significant in God's sight. And I think that's the most important message of astronomy, but most astronomers miss that point. All right, I want to see some stars, nebulae. Mm -hmm. you want to start with a few stars? Yeah. This guy? All right, uh, one of my favorite constellations is out this time of year. This is March, or just the beginning of March. It's still winter. And you can see these three stars in a straight line right there. Yep. That's the belt of Orion. And up here we have Betelgeuse. That's one of his shoulders. This star over here is his other shoulder. Down here is Rigel. It's one knee and there's another knee. And uh, so it's kind of a box with a, with a belt in between here. If you look below the belt, you'll see two or three stars going the other direction there. Well, the middle one's kind of fuzzy. That's uh, the location of what we call the Great Orion Nebula. Hmm. That's my second favorite thing to look at through a telescope. You know what my favorite is? Saturn. Ah. I've been looking at it for over a half century, never get tired of it. Unfortunately, it's not out this time <laughs> this time of year. But um, I've got the telescope on. Why don't you climb up and okay. take a look through the eyepiece and let me know what you think. That is cool. So what I'm seeing are three or four stars. Yeah, there should be a glow around it. Yeah. The lights are kind of bright in here. Right. Looks better if we turn the lights down. <laughs> yeah, okay, I got it now. I got it now. And... Um, there are four stars in the middle called the trapezium. It's a little cluster, real close together. And they're powering that, that, uh, that light that you see. Huh. They're giving off uh, ultraviolet light that ionizes the gas around it. But that's an incredible thing to see in a, in a truly dark sky, which is not bad around here. There's also a, another star that shouldn't be there, this reddish looking star right there. That's the planet Mars. Mars is the most disappointing planet in many respects. It's good only a couple of times uh, about every other year. Because it's further away right now. Oh yeah, it's a small planet. It gets really close and gets farther away. And also right above Mars, you can see a little knot of stars. That is the Pleiades star cluster. It's a really a cool thing. You know, in Japan, they call the Pleiades Subaru. Huh. If you look at the symbol, it's this oval with five or six stars in yeah. it in the shape of that star cluster. And what's interesting is both um, Orion and the Pleiades are mentioned three times in the Old Testament, twice in Job and once in Amos. And they're grouped together, he who made Orion and the Pleiades. And it's because they're, I think they're both in the same part of the sky, very distinctive, very recognizable. Most people have seen the belt of Orion. Most people have seen the Pleiades in the sky. Maybe didn't know what they were, but they have, have seen them in the sky. Can we take a look at Mars with this telescope? We could. Uh, it's uh, take me a moment to get over there, but I can I can do that. Aren't you amazed when you see the incredible design and beauty of our universe? Let me send you this print, the Eagle Nebula, for free. And this will tell everybody that you believe that God created the heavens and the earth. Let me also encourage you to get our entire four-part series, Our Awesome Universe, Big Bang or Big God. Contact us right now. Request your creation resources today when you give to support in grace. 
when your gift is $50 or more, you'll receive our exclusive Heavens Declare bundle, a $110 value for only $50. Call 800-78-GRACE or visit ingrace.tv to get your resources today. Let's take an imaginary tour of the cosmos, starting at our sun. Let's say you started at midnight on January 1st. And let's also say you could travel on a beam of light as it left the sun. If the planets were lined up correctly, you could visit them as you traveled outwards into the solar system. In about three and a half minutes, you'd reach Mercury, the smallest planet in the solar system. It's even smaller than some of the moons of the other planets. Your next stop is the planet Venus which you would reach at about six minutes after midnight. Venus is sometimes called the morning star because it can shine so brightly in our sky. It's also called Earth's sister planet because some of its characteristics are similar to Earth's. You wouldn't reach the Earth itself until more than eight minutes after you left the sun. Even though you're traveling at a blistering speed, 186,000 miles per second, you're starting to see how vast the solar system is. You'd pass Mars at about 12 minutes after midnight, maybe seeing both of its moons as you went by. By now, you're starting to notice that the planets get farther and farther apart as you continue deeper into the solar system. Your next stop is the planet Jupiter, the majestic king of our solar system, so much larger than the Earth. You wouldn't reach it until more than 41 minutes past midnight. As you go by, you reflect on the fact that the secular model says that Jupiter shouldn't exist. At about 1.15 in the morning, you'd pass Saturn and admire its glorious rings. The secular model says Saturn shouldn't exist either, but of course it does. At about 2.30, you'd reach Uranus, the mysterious planet that rolls along on its side as it orbits the Sun, instead of spinning like a top, which is what the secular model predicts. As with Jupiter and Saturn, the secular model says Uranus shouldn't be there either. The last planet you'll visit before you leave the solar system is Neptune. You wouldn't reach it until 4 a.m. Again you see a planet which the secular model says shouldn't exist, but it does. By this point you'd have traveled about 2.8 billion miles, an incomprehensible distance. At this vast distance, the Sun appears to be just another star among many. The Earth itself has shrunk to a mere dot, as you see in this famous photograph taken from the Voyager 1 spacecraft as it left the solar system. That tiny point you see suspended in a sunbeam is our home. Oh, well, here we go. Now what you'll see is a little uh, disk of a planet. The uh, stars are pinpoints, and some of the lights you'll have to shade your eyes to see it, but you'll see a little, little orange ball in there but again, it's, it's pretty small. Oh yeah, that is so fascinating. There are stars that pulsate like this, they get brighter and they get dimmer like that. And then there are stars that, uh, that are irregular, some stars are spotted. Is the sun pretty consistent then compared oh, yeah, the to sun, all those? The sun varies a little tiny bit, but barely. So that's, but that's planned then, right? Well, that's even better than that. <laughs> <laughs> People started looking for solar analogs decades ago. Stars like the sun. And they discovered something about G-type main sequence stars. They vary by a couple of percent many times, which is disastrous if the sun did that. So they found out that the sun is unusually stable for the type of star that it is. They've now found a few stars they think that are stable like the sun. But yeah, the sun is incredibly stable. And uh, again, that could be an accident, <laughs> but I don't I'd rather, so. Yeah, I'd rather doubt that. <laughs> yeah, I, I tell people, if you think it's a coincidence, just how many coincidences are you allowed to have <laughs> before you begin to realize that maybe something isn't, isn't a coincidence anymore. Right. Of course, most stars are too far away to have much of an effect on the Earth. Nevertheless, there's one star that is crucial to life on our planet, the sun. Our sun sustains life on Earth in many ways. First, the sun provides food for us. The Earth's food chain is based on plants and algae. These convert the sun's energy into sugars and starches, which are eaten by other creatures, some of which then provide food for other creatures as well. 
Ultimately, all of our food is derived from the sun's energy. Without the sun, the Earth's entire food chain would collapse. The sun also provides oxygen for us. Plants and phytoplankton use the sun's energy to absorb carbon dioxide and produce oxygen via photosynthesis. Without the sun, there would be no source of oxygen for us to breathe. The sun provides warmth. Without the sun, the earth would plunge into a permanent freeze. And the sun is the proper size and type to make the earth a nice place to live. If the sun were a different size or type, life as we know it would not be possible here. Lastly, the sun is located in the right part of our galaxy to sustain life, about 26,000 light years out from the center of our Milky Way. If the sun were closer in toward the middle, the Earth would be bombarded by X-rays and gamma rays from the galactic center. If the sun were farther out, its orbital period would no longer match the rotation rate of the Milky Way, and we would be more likely to drift into our galaxy's spiral arms, where radiation levels are higher. Also, our sun's orbit is circular. If our orbit were more elliptical, we would again be more likely to drift into the arms. But our sun is just the right type, in just the right spot, and in just the right orbit to sustain life on Earth. Our sun is exceptionally well designed for us to live here, but you've probably been told otherwise. We're 93 million miles from the sun. There are a couple stars that if they were at the center of the solar system, we would be orbiting around inside of it. So. Wow. Well, this has been fascinating. I appreciate your, your time coming out on a cold night, but uh, showing us the skies, incredible. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. We really love talking with Dr. Faulkner. You can really sense his love and excitement for the Creator. Another man who deeply loves the Creator is my friend, Dr. Carl Ball. And I knew that he knew a lot about the universe. And so we went to talk with him in Glen Rose, Texas, to gain more insight into how awesome our universe really is. You have this really beautiful illustration uh, you call creation and symphony. Yes. Because you see in the days of creation, you can see such beauty and, and almost music, right? Yes. The specific design not only in the macrocosm in those spiral galaxies, but we have 60,000 proteins in every cell in a hundred different specific configurations. It has to be exact. The odds that those 60,000 proteins could be specifically oriented for life to be carried on is one chance in 10 to the 4 million 478,296 power. Which is now impossible. Uh, beyond, beyond impossible. impossible. Beyond, Im beyond possibility yeah. of a billion universes yeah. all simultaneously crunching the numbers. Mm. Absolutely impossible. Mm. There is a God, mm. he did create, and if we will just look inside every cell of every little flower, every little bunny rabbit nearby, every cell, inside the macrocosm, the design of the spiral galaxies, all had to be designed, created, and carried out by a loving, loving, compassionate creator. And it was here on this planet where he came to walk with us, to show us what God was like, show his compassion, go to Calvary, but that's not all. Not only did he die for us, Pastor, but as you know, he arose from the dead. Amen. He conquered death and gives us life. So what does all this mean? The incredible design and beauty of the universe. Well, it means that we're here for a reason and a purpose. And most people don't know, where did I come from? Why am I here and where am I going? Well, the Bible gives us all that information and it tells us that we are created and we are here for a purpose, but we've messed up, we've sinned, we've fallen short of the glory of God. So what are we gonna do? Well, God loves you so much that he solved a problem that you couldn't solve. We have a problem called sin and that sin separates us from God and it really separates us uh, to, to have to face uh, an eternity in a lake of fire that he designed for the devil. Well, that's not what God wants, and I'm sure that's not what you want, but God who is rich in mercy and in his grace 
allowed his only begotten son, Jesus, who came into this world for a very specific reason. That is to save us from our sins. He died on a cross, taking upon himself our sins, and he rose again the third day. And he said that if you will believe in him, to trust in him, you will have everlasting life. What does that mean? That means that you can't save yourself. Most people think I have to be good. I have to try harder. If you try hard to be good, you're gonna find out pretty quickly that you can't. The problem is we have no solution in and of ourselves. That's why God had to come and pay this incredible sacrifice for our sins. And the Bible says, if you'll simply trust in the Lord Jesus Christ today, right now, you will be saved. Aren't you amazed when you see the incredible design and beauty of our universe? Let me send you this print, the Eagle Nebula, for free. And this will tell everybody that you believe that God created the heavens and the earth. Let me also encourage you to get our entire four-part series, Our Awesome Universe, Big Bang or Big God. Contact us right now. Request your creation resources today when you give to support in grace. When your gift is $50 or more, you'll receive our exclusive Heavens Declare bundle, a $110 value for only $50. Call 800-78-GRACE or visit ingrace.tv to get your resources today. Join us next week for part three of our awesome universe. Big Bang or Big God? We were placed here by a loving and a powerful God, but a Absolutely. God that also cares about us. And all these things we typically don't even think of, we just right. take them for granted, and we tend to be oblivious to what our Creator has done for us. But when you really start considering how unusual the Earth is, how unusual even the Sun is, yeah. compared to the planets and the stars you see elsewhere, it's a great picture. That's amazing. Record every single In Grace episode. You will be so blessed as we learn all about God's world and God's Word. In Grace is a viewer-supported ministry. Thank you for your prayers and gifts.